آزادی بیان یعنی لون زیو فری سپیچ And we take our name from Article 19 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which guarantees freedom of expression. Article 19 has been for the last 20, almost 25 years promoting and protecting freedom of expression worldwide. And uh, it's a pleasure to host this event tonight together with Free Speech Debate, which is a research project of the Dialogue Program for the Study of Freedom at St. Andrew, St. Anthony College of the University of Oxford as well as the uh, website, Montenegro website, which you see on the screen. And uh, it's aimed to promote discussion of various freedom expression related uh, topics. It also encourages uh, users to participate on this uh, project. So if you don't know the website or you haven't seen it before, please take a look and take part in this fascinating project. The reason why we are hosting this uh, event uh, tonight is to contribute to very active debate recently on the uh, on the uh, ACTA, which is an abbreviation of the anti faith trade agreement and no intellectual property enforcement treaty. ACTA, as well as similar national legislations such as SOMA and PIPA in the US, which gain a lot of prominence have become a lightning rod recently of the public dissatisfaction with attempts to crack down freedom of expression on the internet and have caused a huge public outcry of being anti-internet legislation. There have been hundreds of people protesting against ACTA in uh, various cities around Europe and this map shows as of April 2012 a number of protests that have taken place in various cities and countries around Europe. And, uh, also show you that it doesn't mean just no few people, it has been thousands of demonstration in Krakow, Poland. This is in the Czech Republic, uh, where I come from. This is Paris in France, coast of Germany, and so on. What about England? England has been the problem, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully, it will change after this debate, uh, after the, uh, the fascinating work which free uh, speech debate and argument that we have been doing jointly. So I return to free speech debate, so you can see. And um, I would like to the campaign against ACTA last year in December, where we analyzed the treaty from the freedom of expression perspective under the freedom of expression standards, and we recommended the European Parliament to reject ACTA. We also lobbied quite extensively in the various of the European Parliament and have given last uh, last month in the testimony at the stakeholders uh, meeting uh, which was organized on the implications of ACTA by the Lincoln Party. On the other hand, we have to acknowledge that supporters of ACTA uh, assert that the treaty, civil national legislation, are needed to protect uh, and to, to fight the infringements of intellectual property and to fight organized crime. The argument of supporters of ACTA is very uh, simple. Creative property is just as the real property and as a physical property and therefore must attract similar protection uh, as uh, online as offline. However, Article 19 is quite concerned about the force which these rather superficial arguments have gained among legislators and courts and by the fact that the legislators are very eager to adopt the legislation which protecting intellectual property restricts freedom of expression. We are also very concerned that in the debates on the enforcement regime for intellectual property, freedom of expression is uh, fairly absent and uh, has been basically left on the sidelines or have been reduced as just one of the exceptions that can be used for not restricting intellectual property. We as a freedom of expression organization believe that freedom of expression cannot be left to such margins and it should be central to the ethos of the internet and should underpin all discussion on the freedom of information and ideas. We also believe that it is necessary for those concerned with defending freedom of expression to address the expanding scope of the intellectual property rights and increasing drastic measures taken to enforce them. 
This debate should also include broader issues about enforcement of intellectual property and issues such as how does ownership of uh, ideas affect how we exist together in the world, how does the spread of ideas help push forward better understanding from the people, what price are we willing to pay to keep ideas free, how do we decide who deserves access to ideas, who gets to build on them, who gets to own them, and who gets to censor them for what price. We hope that we will explore this issue in the debate today and we also hope that uh, given the situation we saw on the net in the UK, it will help to uh, improve the understanding of the implications of ACTA in this country. So we have a very distinguished panel who will uh, inform this debate today and they will be introduced in a minute. I just would like to introduce our moderator, Professor Timothy Garton Ash, who is the Sire Berlin Professional Fellow at St. Anthony's College Oxford. He is the author of nine books on history of the present, including most recently Facts Arts Versi, and writes a weekly column in The Guardian, which is widely syndicated in Europe, uh, Asia, and the Americas. He is also currently working on a book about global free speech, which is drawn on the free speech debate project. Okay, so you are encouraged to uh, tweet or update your Facebook status um, on the, I should show you the Twitter website, which will be in the hashtag, which now I forgot them. <laughs> I want to probably remind you, or we'll just tweet, hash, and, you know, like that, and uh, free speech, or... FSD, FSD actor. FSD actor, yes, FSD, uh, FSD actor is the hashtag, so please uh, tweet, and um, I also hope that you will stay till the end, because we will have some drinks and a refreshment, uh, so we will invite you for drinks afterwards. So welcome everyone and your experiences. Thank you very much, Barbara. We, we have some incredibly high-tech microphones on the table here. Can you hear us at the back? Yes. Yeah, well, they're, they're, they're working. Um, um, this, this is, I think, the 3rd of May, which, um, for those of you who know Poland, know is a great day in Poland because it's the day of one of the first liberal constitutions in Europe. And um, I, I think it's very interesting that, if you look at that map there, there were massive demonstrations in Poland against ACTA. This is something totally new to Boston about independence or the Soviet Union or the Catholic Church or abortion it was about act and so there was a really remarkable mobilization in a quite unexpected place. Uh, on the other hand, in our own beloved Britain, uh, there were about three dots there. Um, so that's, I think, a very good reason to have this debate this evening. Um, I do want to say that we're delighted to be doing this with Article 19. Um, Free Speech Debate, uh, the research project, the multilingual research project uh, I lead at Oxford University, is not a campaigning organization. Uh, so this is not a stop actor event. It's an event to try and understand the whole context around actor. Although if you felt tempted also to tweet under the hashtag stop actor, you're welcome to do so. <laughs> um, so free speech debate, very, very briefly, uh, the premise of the project is, put very simply, we are all neighbours now. Either because we live in cities where people from all over the world live cheek by jowl and more than 300 languages are spoken in London, and or because we're all online, two billion people online, another two billion people connected by mobile phone, and that's four billion people who are potential neighbors. And therefore we have to talk about what should be the global norms for free speech. Uh, norms which don't necessarily need to be implemented by laws of particular states, but nonetheless are norms. And actually we just had a big review of this project which, if one goes back to the website, I don't know, you can ping back to the website somewhere, so I'll is, um, is, it's the right hand, um, yeah, that's it, brilliant, is up there in 30 languages. What language are we in now? Farsi? I think we're in Farsi, aren't we? Yeah, anyway, there you are. So if you're Farsi, it's a bit rusty, there it is in Farsi. It has 10 draft principles on free speech. We just had a review of the project in Oxford last week. 
and decided that we have to have something on intellectual property. Because it's quite clear, if you look at the Silkwang Pika mobilization, which was massive, our launch event with, with Jimmy <coughs> Wales, who had just contributed massively to forcing the withdrawal of the, at least the, the bill, the draft bill of Silkwang Pika, and on ACTA across the world, that this is a huge free speech issue. Um, that's the context for this debate. The way we're going to do it is the following. Um, uh, I'm going to just very, very briefly introduce the four speakers. There's a choreography to how they're going to speak. Uh, they're each going to speak for five to an absolute maximum of ten minutes, showing incredible discipline, particularly for academics. Uh, and then we'll have plenty of time for, for discussion in the room. So Gabriela Guillermin, who is a legal officer of Article 19, is going to speak first. And she is going to lay out, in a sense, the larger context as seen by Article 19. Then on my immediate right, Andrew Murray, who is Professor of Law at the LSE and a great expert on IT law, cyber law, regulation, all these related areas, is not only going to give his perspective, but I'm not going to say he's going to be devil's advocate, but is at least going to try and give some understanding for the legitimate reasons for believing there might be a need for something like an actor. Uh, Amelia Andersdotter, who is a Swedish pirate member of the European Parliament, uh, is going to give us some account of the way the debate has played out in the European Parliament. I think the very interesting way it's played out in the European Parliament. And then last but not least, Philippe Egrin, who heads an NGO called La Quadrature du Net, um, is going to give both an activist perspective on it, but also, I think, explore some possible alternative approaches to it. We're going to speak in that order, and then maybe have a little conversation among ourselves, and then bring you in for the conversation. And do please tweet away while we're speaking. Once again, hashtag FSB Avatar. Gabriela. Well, thank you very much, everybody, for coming tonight. It's a great pleasure to have you here. Now, you may be wondering why an organisation such as Article 19, which is a free speech organisation, is concerned about what is uh, an international trade agreement and what an international trade agreement has anything to do with free expression and fundamental rights uh, generally. Now, ACTA is not just about counterfeiting, as, as its name would seem to suggest, but it's also about copyright, and more specifically, it is about copyright enforcement. And to use the language of the creative industries, ACTA is very much about cracking down on online piracy. Now, I want to be clear that online piracy is a very serious issue. But what we would like you to do is just to pause for a moment and just think about the very nature uh, of the internet and what it's allows, allowed us to, us to do. The rise of the internet means that today, pretty much all cultural products, um, including songs, movies, video games, books, can be created as digital files. Now that means that these files can be transferred and downloaded countless times and also using, for example, peer-to-peer -peer networks shared with millions of other internet users. So now it is incredibly easy to share your favorite TV shows with millions of other people. So in the past 10 years, we've really witnessed an explosion in, in, cultural, in culture sharing. And um, internet users, individuals, have not just been passive recipients of, um, of information and culture, but have also used the internet to express themselves. And you only need to go on YouTube to, to witness that. Now, this explosion in the sharing of culture and democratization of culture has not been matched 
uh, by an explosion in the sales of music or movies as the creative industry would have hoped to. Uh, and uh, on the contrary, they've been very worried uh, about the internet, which um, they largely see as a giant copy machine that uh, allows uh, potential customers to bypass their rights. Um, so ACTA comes in and is pretty much the latest international measure uh, that the creative industries have been pushing for to crack down on online piracy. I'm just going to give you a little bit, of, a little bit of background about ACTA, uh, but um, Andrea will, will talk more about um, the proceedings in, in the European Parliament. But ACTA is essentially uh, an international trade agreement which has been negotiated in secret by um, a small number of states that include the United States, Canada, Australia, <coughs> Morocco, Mexico, um, and the EU. Uh, the um, the ratification process is ongoing, and right now we're at a crucial moment where the European Parliament uh, has a golden opportunity to scrutinise uh, uh, the Act and, um, as we hope, reject it. Now, what are Article 19's concerns um, with ACTA? There are several of them, so I would invite you to get copies of our briefing, which gives a, a detailed account of are concerns with it, uh, you can also go on our website. But I'm just going to focus on three uh, main concerns that we have uh, with ACTA. The first concern that we have is that ACTA inadequately uh, protects freedom of expression and fundamental rights. And this is well illustrated by the fact that intellectual property rights are mentioned no less than 43 times in ACTA. Now, this is also understandable, and from a free speech, uh, from a human rights perspective, intellectual property rights are recognised as uh, human rights. For example, under the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights. And the problem is that fundamental rights are not mentioned; they're only referred to as fundamental principles, and freedom of expression is only mentioned twice as a principle rather than as a right, despite the fact that it's recognised as such under international law. So that's our first problem. The second problem we have uh, with ACTA is the lack of clarity of its criminal provisions. And so, for example, you might think that it is okay to um, transfer a file uh, from your iPod, like a song, uh, to your computer. But under ACTA, uh, this type of behaviour, which is uh, fairly trivial, could potentially be uh, criminalised and lead to criminal penalties. Um, terms like commercial scale are not defined. So this is a problem. The last problem, the third uh, issue uh, we have uh, with ACTA is that it basically puts pressure on ISPs to disclose their customers' details uh, to um, uh, copyright holders without the required safeguards under international law. So how does this work? Essentially, ACTA promotes um, cooperative efforts between rights holders and intermediaries because if the rights holders think that there may be an infringement of their rights, they want to get the, the IP address and the details of this, what they suspect is the alleged infringer. Now, um, what they want to avoid is to um, go through the judicial process, which is what we say is how this should be done. So this is one of the pro this is the problem with um, the the system that ACTA seeks to promote. And finally, since ACTA has its as its main purpose to prevent uh, copyright infringement, we don't we find it hard to to see how they they could do that without essentially pushing for the monitoring of the communications of internet users. So these are, in a nutshell, the, pro the problems that we see uh, that ACTA poses for fundamental rights and freedom of expression, and why we think that ACTA does not strike the right balance between intellectual property rights and fundamental rights. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gabriella. That was both pithy and lucid. And 
Right, uh, before I start, I think I need to preface what I'm going to say with a couple of things. First of all, um, I was told to 10 minutes, but we've done about seven. Um, being an academic, I'm programmed to speak for 50 minutes as soon as I start, so I do have a prepared speech. My, some of my students in the audience will tell you I don't usually do this, but it's the only way I can finish in time. Um, the second thing I'm going to say is I am going to play a little bit of devil's advocate um, and because I realised somebody had to defend ACTA to an extent. Um, so just before I actually begin my prepared speech, I'm just going to start with a little bit of perhaps language. We heard terms such as share and culture of sharing. Let, let's be honest, by share we mean copy. By copy we mean take without paying the person who created. You might call it stealing, you might not. Democratisation. The internet is very democratising. Um, I feel very democratised when I can download the latest episode of Homeland without waiting for it to be shown on the UK and without paying the advertiser to support the broadcaster who pays the production company. Anyway, that's just language. Now, my brief this evening, actually, is to be the independent academic perspective on actor. You probably think I'm not being independent at the moment. Um, this is not an easy task. Uh, so I'm going to start by doing the old academic trick of taking the instruction apart and addressing each element one by one, and of course in reverse, because this is what academics do to show they're independent. So perspective, this is several definitions dependent upon use. Uh, I assume I'm to employ the definition, the state of one's ideas, the facts known to one. Immediately there's a problem here, perspective is subjective, independent is objective. Thus, to retask task, I'm being asked to supply an objective, academic, subjective analysis. So I now know how Werner Heisenberg felt when he first encountered what would become known as the uncertainty principle. The only thing I'm now certain of is that I am uncertain. So let's leave perspective to one side. Academic, again, brings many definitions. I'm not sure whether I was being asked to be theoretical or hypothetical, not practical, realistic or directly useful, or learned or scholarly but lacking in worldliness, common sense or practicality. Whichever, I'm not designated to be practical or useful. So I think some people decided that as soon as I started to speak. So I have an objective, uh, so I have to give an objective, impractical, subjective view an actor. Which gives me to my key point, independent. This is the word I think is the key to this. So I'm going to change tack for a moment. Is Rupert Murdoch a fit and proper person to run a major corporation? <laughs> the report of the Culture, Media and Sports Select Committee said he wasn't, or did it. No, what it actually said was the majority of the committee felt he wasn't. Actually, no, it didn't really even say that. It said that Liberal, the Labour and Lib Dem committee members felt he wasn't. Conservative committee members thought he was. Why am I doing all of this when I only have five minutes? The lesson, vastly oversimplified, is there's no such thing as a truly independent analysis in subjects of high emotive value. And I'm not going to get into subjectivism versus objectivism here, that's for another day. So I'm just trying to fulfil my brief, but begin by saying that everyone carries biases and baggage. And here I'm addressing this mostly to the room. So, should ACTA be adopted by the EU? Okay, you're going to be pleased to hear, in short, I think no, but not for the reasons that you might expect to hear. Um, I think that I have a different perspective to the other speakers. I think ACTA should be rejected not because of potential harms to liberty, freedom, or future of the internet, but because it's a fundamentally poorly drafted piece of legislation which has not had proper scrutiny to ensure it can be fairly and equally applied in a bilateral manner. Let's take a couple of examples. Article 23 says each party shall provide for criminal procedures and penalties to be applied at least in cases of willful trademark counterfeiting or copyright or related rights piracy on a commercial scale. Well, generally, I think that's okay. UK law already applies criminal penalties for commercial scale copyright infringement, section 107 of the CDPA, if anybody wants to look it up, and in trademark infringement, section 92 of the Trademarks Act. But what are the words at least doing there? They're simply adding confusion and uncertainty which need not be there. Surely all co-drafters of ACTA can agree that criminal penalties are appropriate in cases of commercial infringement, but the civil penalties, possibly including punitive damages, are better suited to other forms of infringement. This will no doubt just lead to different states applying different standards, thus undermining the stated aim of ACTA to establish international standards for intellectual property rights enforcement. Another example of such plurality of standards is the famous Article 14.2, the TSA iPod provision. A party may exclude from the application of this section small quantities of goods of a non-commercial nature contained in a traveller's personal luggage. Why may? Why not will? 
Again, this demonstrates the problem of negotiating an enforcement treaty as a multilateral trade agreement. What's wrong with ACTA is not that it's substantively bad, it's because it's procedurally appalling and therefore is fundamentally flawed as a result. The usual IP drafting bodies like WIPO, WTO, UNSTRAL were locked out. Also locked out were anyone not subjectively in favour of strong IP enforcement. <coughs> the developing countries from Brazil, Russia, India and China. Other developing economies were also locked out as well as civil society groups. It's this lack of input that really to me makes ACTA useless. But that doesn't mean that ACTA type provisions are all as harmful as we think. So my next question is, is an ACTA type provision as harmful as we think it is? So here I begin by remembering that I'm speaking to a self-selected audience. And remember my point above about object objectivity being largely illusory when dealing with matters of high emotive value. Repeatedly we've been told ACTA is harmful to free expression or will lead to monitoring of our internet activities or will lead to us being cut off or for websites to be blocked. <laughs> that, that course is already out. <laughs> Hold the stable door as much as you want, but um, it's already gone. Just this arm has looked after that. I, as objectively as I can, don't agree with these clearly subjective views. In their brief to the European Parliament, Article 19 state their concern that despite a single reference to protection of free expression and preamble to the agreement, in the text there is limited references and they suggest Article 6 and 27. But note there is a threat to free expression due to a lack of guidance. But ACTA is an IP enforcement provision, not a fundamental rights provision. Let's look at TRIPS. Actually, no references whatsoever are made to freedom of expression in TRIPS. Uh, what about the enforcement directive? One reference, Recital 2, for those of you who are interested, and nothing in the articles. This is because these, and no doubt ACTA or whoever becomes next, must be read within the larger corpus of the law. The people who draft it know this. Our rights are protected elsewhere, at EU level by Article 11, speech, Article 7, privacy, and Article 8, data protection, of the Charter of Fundamental Rights. You cannot read an enforcement treaty separately from other provisions, in particular treaty or charter provisions. In effect, a well-drafted ACTA, not the one we have now, would, in my view, potentially be no more invasive or restrictive than the framework of laws that we currently have in place. So this is the IP Enforcement Directive, Section 97A of the Copyright Designs and Patents Act, and the Digital Economy Act, which is still there on the statute book. Don't forget it. It hasn't gone away. Finally, Tim will be very pleased to hear this, a very short point. Um, we've all got to think about what we want from IP in the 21st century. Uh, no one believes all speech ought to be free. If you are one of these people, then that's fine, but uh, I'm not going to try and defend race, hate, speech, violence, speech, or shouting fire in a crowded theatre. Um, similarly, no one holds the, the Plutonian notion that property is theft. Absent, our absent radical Marxists remembering that Marx was critical of Pluton, we must recognise that authors and creators were right to protect their investment and to be awarded for it. Um, the internet has changed this balance radically. We've heard this already, how easy it is to copy, distribute, send. Now we'll hear people saying things like, well, if I copy a file, then there's no harm done. I haven't taken anything. But you have. I was walking here tonight, and I was walking past a shop, and it started to rain, and they'd umbrellas outside, say, 4 99 And I thought, I could buy an umbrella, or I could walk, or I could take that umbrella, walk down the road, and then drop it off later when I go back. Is that okay? Because they haven't suffered any loss if I just take their umbrella, use it, and take it back? Uh, the internet has altered this balance. Authors and musicians in the past were protected by high red production costs, costs reduced to near zero. If we want to encourage the creation of art, literature and cultural goods, we must have a balanced incentivization scheme. I'm an author. I like to get my royalties. This means we must accept IP needs to be reviewed and made fit for purpose. This, to me, means that unless we're all going to take responsibility ourselves for not taking without paying, that there's going to be more pressure for actor type enforcement in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much. I have, uh, that's fantastic. I have two questions. One is, <laughs> at what point in that did you, did you stop being the devil? And, uh, <laughs> I was, as a good lawyer should be able to do, I was the devil throughout. I was the devil Although I do, believe this, I do believe we can't argue some kind of Pudorian notion of property is theft, right. even in the digital environment. So the bit at the end, the final very short point. So let me just push you just a bit. So, I mean, everybody seems to agree that it was procedurally appalling in a double sense. First of all, the way it was negotiated in secret, etc., etc. Secondly, badly drafted, vagueness, overgrowth, and so on. But are you saying that if you took all that away, its core content would, in your view, be defensible? 
Um, in my view, a core content which rebalanced in favour slightly of intellectual property rights protection, which would involve input from all parties, is defensible because at the moment it's simply too easy to take without thinking of the consequences for the individual. It would be the simplest opinion. So we need, we don't need this act. We don't need this act. But we need something. Well, no. I, I, well, this is, I'm really taking up the speaker's time. No, 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 um, we, 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 may, uh, we don't necessarily need any actor if we take responsibility for complying with IP law and not expect that we should get things without paying for it. Would be my better answer. Got it. Thank you very much. That's extremely clarification. Amelia. Yes, hello. Um, my name is Amelia Anschotter. I'm a member of the European Parliament for the Pirate Party in Sweden. I came to the European Parliament on, well, a, a bit of an arbitrary road. I was kind of elected in 2009, but then there was a treaty switch which actually enabled me to take up my seat only in December of 2011. And I think it can safely be said that I've landed in the European Parliament at one of the most interesting times this legislature. We heard about spectacular protests in Poland, an unexpected place, but I think even more unexpected for the European Parliament and for everyone in Europe was that simultaneous large protests broke up out in all the member states at the same time. I think many MEPs are a bit unused to getting the exact same protest emails from all of their constituencies at the same time. We had uh, many parliaments, national parliaments and governments suddenly suspending their ratification procedure. The Slovak government said that they revoked their signature because they didn't know what they were doing. And the German parliament and the government, along with many other member states' governments, say that actually we will not do anything until the European parliament decides, which created huge political pressure on everyone. When I just came, I think it was a bit difficult for me to judge exactly how tangible the pressure on this issue was in the building. Because I was assuming that in the European Parliament, where everyone makes big and important decisions all the time, the pressure is always high. But I've been told by people who have spent considerably longer time in the institutions than I have that this is really, really, really a big deal. It is not often that you see all of the citizens of all European member states going in the same directions at once. So, in the European Parliament, lots of political pressure. The Social Democratic Group, which is one of the large political groups, decided relatively early after the protests started that they were going to come out against the agreement. The Liberals took considerably longer to decide, but last week they also decided to come out in favor of a rejection. And I must say, what, it, what I find most surprising about the kind of process over the agreement in ACTA is that first, when I had just arrived in December, um, the kind of powers that be, the majority in the parliament, which has always been, which used to always be, be in favor of the agreement, because the parliament as an institution, I believe, sees itself as an institution that approves agreement. We trust in the executive to negotiate in the right way. We trust in them to actually have made a good scrutiny already when we get the document. You have, we have sometimes in the dealings of FTAs that we consider uh, could the human rights of, Colombian, of the Colombian labor force be affected by this agreement in a less pleasant way. But overall, in the end, we need to be, as an institution, responsible enough to approve the decision and the promotion of, of trade with, with other parties. So, this was seen as a quite straightforward process. Everyone was kind of set for this turning into a no. And even I think when the Social Democrats decided to reject, actually it wasn't because the institution as a body had decided that they needed to take an active responsibility for what is in European law, European trade agreements. It was, it was more kind of, of a statement because also in many member states there's elections coming up and conservative governments are currently 27 out of 26. 25 out of 27 member states, so it's a nice political statement to make. Now that it's looking like the majority is for rejection in the parliament, I expect there to be more political pressure in the future. I was the rapporteur for an opinion from the industrial committee, and I'm also the shadow rapporteur for my political group in the parliament, 
um, in the, oh, well, ITRA committee is the industry committee, I said that. So uh, the committee for international trade. And we're seeing now lots of kind of movements around in the committees, people are changing their strategies. And now that it's looking like we have a majority for rejection, this is where I expect the real arguments uh, for making the parliament be responsible and approve the agreement actually to start. We're already seeing some signs of that happening. Many movements in the parliament are currently going neither for rejection nor for approval. Kind of maybe we would instead want to be negotiation uh, of the agreement. So this is um, the battle line I see also. I'm looking very much forward to seeing how the Aldi group, which is inherently split with the liberal group, how they will move on with their dealings of, of this um, agreement. I have already been surprised at some of my, uh, the way that some of my colleagues deal with the decision of the liberal group to, to reject, because to me it still looks very much like the liberal group, at least for some extent, will be wanting to not reject, but not approve, but maybe go for a re renegotiation of the agreement. My personal political bias is towards rejection, just so that nobody is confused about this. But what, what is really incomprehensible with the parliament, though, is how they seem to be so reluctant to make up their mind. Many MEPs, many members of the parliament, have been inherently incapable of saying whether they support or reject. And it's very surprising, given that everyone in the building has been elected to make decisions. <laughs> <laughs> and it's also very surprising to see the kind of arguments that they use to not reject or to approve. Like, for instance, politically right now, saying that you're in favor of the agreement, this wouldn't be really good. But I've seen arguments like intellectual property is property and must be respected because otherwise it's stolen. But this is actually a very bad agreement, a bit of very bad reason to approve the agreement. We have loads of restrictions also on property rights. For instance, in my home country, Sweden, you are not allowed to own a gun without having a license. And even after you do own it, you need to keep it in the locker with the ammo uh, stored separately, and it's not you're not allowed to also have it charged, and it needs to be locked, and it needs to be with a key that only you have on your person all the time, and they sometimes send out inspectors to make sure that this is in fact the case. Um, so this, I mean, the, the, the property argument, I don't find this. This must be using this as a kind of argument for for acta is for lack of other words intellectually dishonest. Um, also, a very surprising thing that happened last week is that now my draft opinion for, for the ITRA, I recommended rejection, of course, but not on the freedom of speech grounds, but on the fact that I don't think that the internet service providers have any particular obligation to, to uphold, to, to deem what is a copyright infringement and what is not. It's bad for business. The evaluation of the e-commerce directive from the European Commission shows this also. Everyone dislikes the current copyright regime, including the enforcement, except the rights holders. It says that, literally. So there's, I mean, the rights holders lobby group is very alone in liking the current enforcement scheme. Um, but then there was this sudden amendment proposal, for my opinion, which said that, well, actually, um, we need to quote these statistics that our opinion already says are unreliable, from 2009, because I, they, they pulled the statistics from a report in 2009 about uh, how counterfeiting is destroying the planet. And actually the parliament said in 2010 that data about this matter cannot be relied upon because it's inconsistent and incoherent. So they're undermining the previous position of the European Parliament by saying that the parliament in 2010 was wrong in its evaluation of the then existing corpus on counterfeiting. And the other amendment that was posted says that our opinion should be taken into account by the International Trades Committee, which I would consider is completely obvious, because actually my committee, the Industry Committee, is very important and should be taken into account automatically. We should not have to ask for this. So I'm kind of, one of the things that really surprised me is the willingness of my colleagues, for lack of better words, not to respect their work. If I was going to argue for ACTA, I would 
try to do so in a way that I could actually maintain my self-respect afterwards, in a bit. <laughs> and it seems, unfortunately, that this is not really the case in the arguments being made. And this was also very difficult for me, to, it's been kind of a difficult process for me, I guess, to integrate myself in this institution also, that there are so many kind of, that, that they're so willing, that the parliament is so willing to contradict itself. This is also why, for instance, the provisions in other legislation aren't so important because we quite obviously have an institution that doesn't that isn't really able to step up and take responsibility for the decisions they made previously or to take all of the texts that they publish um, with with big gravity. And well but we're still I mean we're still going up for votes then in the parliament as it looks currently we'll be having the plenary vote in July and there's not going to be any more delays expected. And we'll, we'll see how it, how it turns out. My concern is, of course, still that the people who will be arguing that we shouldn't make a decision at all may be very successful in promoting this point of view. But I want to believe that somewhere deep down in every politician there is a little decision maker that will finally come out in July. Thank you. I Thank you very much, Amelia. That was wonderful. I wouldn't count on it. How, um, we're fairly sure that the plenary vote will be July. Yeah. Right. But we're not sure what they will decide. So it's recommended that we will reject right now by the rapporteur, right. who is a British Labour MEP, right. David Martin. But there could possibly still be amendments that go along the lines of the European Parliament, not rejecting, but maybe asking for a renegotiation. And if the report uh, is changed into recommending the Parliament to not say yes nor no, then the decision taken in July will be about whether or not we should not say yes or no, or whether we should not say, not say yes or no. <laughs> so, so that makes total self sense. Um, German, German, German has, a, as you know, the wonderful word, jein, <laughs> combination of yes and no. Just the other thing I did want to pick you up on very quickly. Um, you said sort of rather fluently up there that it's not often you see all the citizens of Europe pushing in the same direction. Um, well, all might be a, a touch of hyperbole there. I mean, so many of the citizens of Europe, but then actually, how many of? And, and maybe it's so many of the active online citizens of, the people who email MPs. So do we actually know what are the numbers and who are the people who are emailing their MPs? So the vast majority of emails I've received, I must admit, are from Poland. But over, um, over the scope of maybe two days, I received about 400 emails from Swedish people. I've also received a considerable amount of emails from French people. My reports from the, what I heard from the protests organized in different cities around Europe was 120,000 German people on the street, at least 5,000 people on the streets in Bucharest, in Stockholm about 1,000 people, and in France maybe France Paris maybe about 2,000 people, and this is, I mean, this is still quite a lot, because when you think of kind of what people do with their day-to-day -day lives, there's many people who like kind of using their weekends, maybe hanging out with their children that they don't see in the working week. You cannot expect people to act only as anger cattle, to be kind of shoved out in the street and make a protest every time something is wrong, and actually considering the amount of, um, considering the amount of participation in the public policy debate that a regular citizen normally does, I think ACTA is a very, very clear case of large scale. Do you know, so. could you give a rough sense, just a rough sense of how many sort of citizens' emails you personally have got on ACTA? I mean, could you, is it hundreds of thousands, tens of thousands? Mm, um, maybe about 1,000. 600, 1,700 could be, but bear in mind also many people don't write to me because my political affiliation made them suspect that I would already be. So I've also had about 100 emails saying that people suspect me already to be on the good side. Right. 
there's, there's a lot of Polish ones among those. Uh, a relative yeah. large amount. Polish-like parrots. So that's, that's <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, just to to take uh, on this last question, the the I was petition has two million five hundred thousand signatories, which is uh, a lot even for online petitions. So Avas, however you want to to call it. And so I am here to speak as the activist. So I, I take this role very seriously. I I put my undercover activist clothes. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you're the only one wearing a tie. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And where well, it's but actually it, it totally failed that uh, at uh, Saint Pancras because they stopped me and held me for secondary questioning because <laughs> I had the I had the train ticket boat in Paris to travel from Brussels. So <laughs> now I'm going to do uh, more seriously, I'm going to be a pirate's advocate against the devil's advocate, uh, and uh, uh, and I would like to, to remind you first of what Gabriel Guillemin said in the start, is that ACTA is yet another instrument to try to prevent uh, re, uh, uh, criminalize or deter or uh, dissuade file sharing. Yeah. And uh, actually it was quite explicitly said in the initial negotiation orientation, which I'm holding here, though they have never been published. Uh, and uh, it was saying uh, uh, ACTA will uh, aim at criminal enforcement for significant willful infringements without motivation for financial gain to such an extent as to prejudicially affect the copyright owner, e.g. In internet piracy. And of course you do not read that uh, now in ACTA, uh, uh, and it's partly because we, uh, we are partly responsible, I mean the, the advocacy groups and the activist groups, uh, for ACTA being such uh, an unclear text today, because we, we have forced ACTA uh, proponents to cover their tracks. Uh, and actually, the, uh, uh, there was also a change actually in the demand of internet, uh, interest groups uh, of the entertainment industry principally, uh, in the sense that they, they came to realize that uh, uh, suing for criminal sanction, the 14 year old for sharing uh, a file uh, with some friends was maybe not very good for their image, and uh, so uh, now uh, let's have a momentum has moved towards no longer directly criminalizing the act of sharing files, but rather making it more difficult, impossible, or to dissuade it through brainwashing, uh, according to which it would be a bad thing. And I do not believe it is a bad thing. Uh, uh, however, it is clearly something which is disruptive uh, to the existing state of the cultural economy. Uh, let me remind you that up to 35 years ago, nothing in copyright or author's law never regulated the commercial act of individuals. Never. It, it is only very recently, uh, through the uh, tape recording and, and initially, and then over copying device and then peer-to-peer -peer networks, that copyright law has started caring about what individuals do with words. Uh, uh, and actually, in the past, not only you could take a book like this one, and uh, if it did enter your possession, you can give it, lend it to other people, and actually you could even rent it, sell it. Uh, and this is the ATIF exempted. It's even not included in, in, in the income tax. Uh, it was so strong an exception that it was uh, in, uh, written in law as uh, what the, the Americans call the, the uh, primary cell uh, 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 ex 
exhaustion of rights, and in, in Europe we call that the exhaustion of rights, in the sense that uh, the property, the exclusive rights, which actually are only very recently were truly defined as property, uh, the, the, the exclusive rights uh, that the right holders have on a work, uh, when someone enters in possession of this work, they are exhausted. They, are, they no longer apply in any manner. Now, uh, uh, of course, when the digital world came in, with 2 billion or 4 billion people uh, being uh, endowed with the capability and the tools to copy and exchange works between themselves, uh, the initial momentum was to say, well, that's impossible. I mean, we lose any exclusive control on what people do with work. We create a separate public distribution channel uh, where people will share directly works between themselves. And what ACTA should actually ask us is not just that, uh, whether we want to reject it uh, or which I advocate, or whether we want to give an essence to it. It's what do we want to do with this question on which we have already adopted 20 different uh, harmful texts. Uh, 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 Professor Murray listed a number of texts that pay no attention to freedom of expression or cultural diversity. For, uh, uh, such as the IPR Enforcement Directive. Actually, the IPR Enforcement Directive is is uh, absolutely disgusting test, uh, not only in its content, but in also how it was adopted by by the wife, the CEO of the main content industry uh, company, uh, owning at the time at which he was rapporteur tw the 20 million euro worth of the convertible option on the company of uh, her husband. So it's a, and with a, an empty declaration of interest in the European Parliament. So we are, we, we are speaking really bad processes of legislation, bad texts, 20 of them chart uh, some laws, some treaties, some policies that are uh, some soft law devices. Actually, many of the worst effects of ACTA are things that already exist, but that would be blessed by ACTA. And that is, things like cooperation between ISPs and uh, right holders uh, to, uh, uh, to uh, prevent file sharing uh, uh, that we had in the UK before the Digital Economy Act. And these things are actually probably today illegal according to European law. If they would go all the way to the European Court of Justice or the European Court of Human Rights, they would not stand. But if ACTA is adopted, they would be blessed as cooperation. So instead of entering, uh, let's say, pursuing in this trajectory of uh, uh, trying to eradicate file sharing, uh, another approach has been developed by researchers uh, from 2002 uh, up to now, and uh, this approach is to build ways of living with it uh, by recognizing it uh, with a well circumscribed perimeter of what type of sharing would be allowed. Uh, non-for-profit non uh, in any manner, only between individuals uh, without centralization of content by on sites, uh, only peer-to-peer -peer or, or direct transfer from person to person. Uh, uh, this is uh, and uh, developing new financing schemes uh, that would contribute to the real challenge of the creative economy and the uh, condition of existence of expression in the public sphere. I, I cannot detail these schemes now in the time that I have, but let me just list what are these real challenges that we are not taking in account while we are discussing ACTA and similar texts. The first of these challenge is an enormous increase in the number of people who create works 
that are made accessible to an universal public, even if in some cases only 10 people will actually access them. Uh, and this increase is not just that anybody writes a blog. It's you find it at every level of competence and quality of the products of these activities. And this is the real challenge. Because if you have 10, more, 10 times more people engaging in creative activity, as this center uh, is built to encourage, then you, it means that you have pair, in average, pair work probably eight times less uh, or even 10 times less, even if you concentrate attention, the, the audience and the time allocated to access a work will decrease. So uh, this is the real challenge. When you hear an artist saying the internet is awful because of the internet I sell less or I have less readers or whatever, what they actually mean uh, is something uh, which is much harder to, to solve than piracy. What they mean is there are other guys around who do interesting things. Uh, uh, and uh, while we are holding this meeting, there are 10 meetings in town uh, on similar or, or on subjects that attract the same people that make it your audience actually quite a large audience for this meeting. So this is the real challenge we have to address, and it's a challenge for cultural economics, for public policy. Uh, it is also a challenge for, for how, which technology we develop. It is also a promise, a promise of a more diverse attention to works, because the, the digital economy uh, uh, is not uh, today centered on creative industries. It is centered on rent-seeking industries, industries that, are, that have bought catalogs, uh, that contract very few new artists and, or new projects and blame it on piracy because it's much more comfortable to simply make money with what you have than to bet on an uncertain future. And I think uh, uh, to yesterday I was in another debate on ACTA, and in the end, uh, uh, it was a really contra uh, contradictory debate, with, not just with David Advocates, but uh, with David. <laughs> <laughs> and and, uh, and he, at the end, uh, but they were friendly Davids, they were polite Davids. So at the end, we decided, well, uh, uh, you know, if, if uh, if we still disagree that strongly with people who are reasonable and smart, it's probably because we have different world views and because we don't speak of the same thing. And uh, so the real question between ACTA is, uh, do you want Europe to be a place uh, where people have incentives to create because they are copied? And not, or do you want people uh, 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 where people uh, are prevent, uh, do not need to create because they are protected against copy. Thank you very much. I wonder if either Andrew or Gabriel would like to respond briefly to that vision of intellectual property in the digital age. <laughs> this is a very good question. Um, a few things. I mean, I, I, I agree with, with, with much of what Philippe said, and I, I think a, a vision which encourages creativity is, of course, what we all want. I mean, we want people to feel that they can create and they can use and they can redevelop and produce something new. It's, it's, I think maybe the, the difference is, and I'm, I'm going to keep playing devil's advocate over here, but the difference perhaps is the matter of degree, about what levels of freedom and what levels of control there are. Um, with a different hat on, I work for Creative Commons. Creative Commons is a system within copyright law that allows the freedom to do that. It doesn't mean that people who want to rent seek, whether they are the producers or whether they are the rent seeking industry, should in some way be demonised because they want to rent seek for what they do. 
Um, and I, I disagree, the one thing I would say, I disagree fundamentally with Filippo, is that there, there's nothing new in copyright law that's been brought about because of um, digitization. Um, the, the first sale doctrine is completely different to the reproduction right and dates back to 1709. So it's, if it's new, it's new from 1709. And we've had it ever since then. And that's a different right to the first sale doctrine. If, if I buy a book today or 80 years ago, I couldn't copy parts of that book. I could sell the book, I could rent the book, I could give the book to someone else. And in the same way now, if I have Making an available right? Making it available, as long as the book is not the physical. It's making not Making available right is a new right, entirely yeah. designed for a digital sphere. That's a different thing, because you make a copy. 